Sexual assault versus sexual harassment. What's the difference? Why does it matter? And how does the law look at it? I'm Tom Graham, this is Eric Mausner. We talk about issues and personal injury, and today we're gonna to discuss the differences between sexual assault and sexual harassment. Thankfully, I think uh, society we're entering into a way of viewing um, allegations of sexual assault, sexual harassment with an absolute zero tolerance policy, which is the way it should be. And you know, I remember over the course of the last decade or so, as things were evolving, you would hear conversations surrounding, for instance, the Me Too movement, where back in the day you kind of would flirt with a boss to get a job or maybe you would go out on a date with him to get a job. And I think the viewpoint and how society has um, framed these interactions has totally changed for the better and we're not permitting it. But I still think there's a little bit of confusion as to, well, what is sexual harassment versus what is sexual assault? And it's a somewhat of a blurry line. What do you think about that? I do. I, I tend to think of Harassment maybe more it could be more of a ongoing offensive conduct, maybe a little less serious than the sexual assault, which sexual assault you know is unwanted sexual contact, right? So rape, you know, horrible acts of of you know, sexual violence could probably fall under sexual assault, where sexual harassment might be like a series of conduct that could be going on in the office. Maybe somebody's touching you or putting their hands on you, or maybe someone's doing some you know expressing uh, verbal. Uh, unwanted communication, things like that over time. So I, in my mind, that's at least how I would categorize it. What do you think? Yeah, interesting. I would say I agree. I think, um, you know, as human beings, we have it in our mind and then the law sort of analyzes through a different lens. So through the lens of the law here in Florida for, for torts, for what we do, personal injury, there's something called the impact rule, which requires an actual physical touching to recover injuries. So obviously in a sexual assault, case like the types we would do something bad has happened that's a, an unwanted touching without consent or a, a touching on a child you know because of course a child can't consent or an intoxicated person can't consent now harassment typical harassment is more of um i would say like a, a worker type injury right so a sexual harassment case might even be brought by different attorneys that specialize in that and then we would come into play if there's an actual touching so in terms of harassment I think for us to have a claim, it would need to be what the, eye, the eyes of the law would call intentional infliction of emotional distress, right? And to reach that standard, it's such outrageous con conduct, such outrageous conduct that um, society says unacceptable. Now, perhaps some of the things we've seen in the news over the last few years would rise to that level, but I think intentional infliction of emotional distress claims, what is called IIED, exceedingly difficult. The courts don't like them. But if we have a touching, Florida's impact rule kicks in and we can bring a lawsuit for an unwanted touching. And I think it's also important from taking off the, the legal lens, putting on the human lens, sexual assault and sexual harassment, they walk hand in hand. Oftentimes we'll hear about fact patterns where there's a lot of creepy, inappropriate things said and then eventually uh, the assailant feels bold enough to do something and physically touch the person. So, you know, I think that it's a gray, murky line, um, but, that, that touching is required for a personal injury claim. And um, if it's an ongoing situation that's making someone uncomfortable, I think in this day and age, their, hopefully their, their corporate culture where they're working or the place where it occurred would be receptive to hearing them out, putting a stop to it. I mean, it should be a zero toler tolerance policy on anything that makes someone uncomfortable. Yeah, but also keep in mind sexual assault and sexual harassment, sometimes there can be a civil case and there also can be a criminal case. So if you are a victim of sexual abuse, and the first step you'd want to go is the police, um, report it to the police, local department. Uh, even certain counties have um, sex crimes units, or you can even sometimes call the, the, your local prosecutor's office as well. They'll have sex crimes units as well. And, and then you can report it. You can turn over all the evidence. That you, um, and it's also, you know, if, if you are the, the victim of a forcible rape, you know, that's the kind of thing you want to go to the hospital as well, uh, preserve evidence, you know, um, witnesses, photos, videos. So there's a lot of things to do. So if you do find yourself in that situation, you know, consult with the police or you can consult with a personal injury lawyer as well uh, to preserve evidence and protect your claim and, uh, and you know, and then start the process of healing. Totally. And, and you, you bring up a good point. Um, 
these cases are so sad and so psychologically impactful, uh, you know, and I think these victims need strong support. But one of the first things that, that women will do uh, if they are sexually assaulted, they'll go home and they will shower. And they do that because they want to get, they want that cleansing. They want to get it physically off them. And I think psychologically to take a hot bath or take a shower is something that makes them maybe feel more comfortable. And we'll get questions, does that mean the case is impossible? And the answer is no. It's just something that happens. There's actually um, psychologists that study this and expert witnesses that can explain why people act the way they do. So for instance, showering off physical evidence, it, it, much more common than you would think. Not reporting something for maybe even years, much more common than someone would think. And there's an emerging body of psychological and scientific research that explains why people react the way they do when they're following such a horrific trauma. If you've been drugged as well in a sexual assault case, whether you're a man or a woman, get to the hospital and get a blood test so you, you, the doctors can see what's inside your system. That's a way of, of, pr of helping prove that incident thereafter. I think a lot of people might ask us, there's like a continuum of wrongdoing. It might be really obvious somewhere and then on another side, it might not be quite so obvious. So let's say a coworker says something like, wow, you have such, such nice eyes, such beautiful eyes. What are your thoughts? Is that sexual harassment? If it's a one-time occurrence, I don't think that's sexual harassment yet. It may start to feel, if, if the other person starts to feel uncomfortable about it though, I think it needs to be addressed, perhaps before it even progresses. And what about, let's say, um, let's say a kiss on the cheek? Is that like a hello kiss, a goodbye kiss? I mean, some cultures do two kisses, right? I think it, it depends on the, maybe the culture of the country and, and what's going on, what's expected. You give a coworker a kiss on the cheek. Is it a daily thing? Is this happening daily? Is it a one time? Let's say, let's take this example, a boss is drinking too much, gets drunk and starts asking uh, an employee to have sex or to have some sort of a sex act with other employees. Harassment? Absolutely. I think uh, probably grounds for termination, that kind of behavior. Highly unprofessional, highly inappropriate, probably offensive to numerous people involved. I think so. So interesting though, but the kiss on the cheek gray area, let's change the hypothetical there and um, let's say that the victim had said, I'm not really comfortable with this. I want to keep the relationship professional. How about we do a handshake if you want? Um, and the kiss happens again. So is this like a, a killer? Let's give me some more context here. Is this walk in the morning, say hi and give a kiss on the cheek yeah. in the office? In the office, yeah. um, in Miami. No, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's normal behavior. And if someone's going to ask, ask for it to stop and it keeps happening, yeah, I think you have workplace harassment going on there change the hypothetical and you're working on a project, you're working kind of closely with a group and you're all getting to know each other and it's a stressful project and your project manager is kind of like massaging your shoulders like, you got this one more night and we're gonna make this deal, it's gonna get done and they're, they're touching like that. It's not invited touching, but it's certainly not normal for the workplace. Harassment? Potentially, potentially, I think so. It just depends on what the relationship is, right? And the comfort level. It, that, you know, I think any type of physical touching in the office between employees, that can raise some red flags. So I would, I would steer clear of that kind of behavior. What about taking a photograph? Where is the appropriate place to place a hand if you're taking a photograph with a colleague? Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but with some celebrities, I think like Keanu Reeves now, if he's taking a photo, he doesn't touch the person. He kind of hovers his hands, which um, is interesting, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I think celebrities, athletes, uh, you know, rappers, these kinds of people who are in the hot, in the limelight uh, have to be extra careful. But um, at the workplace, I think you know if you're taking a photo and, you, and that people's hands touch each other's backs, I think that I think that's normal if it's you know one-time behavior. I think if those hands start to go into certain areas of the body, though, then you, that that are considered private parts or um, more personal space, I think then you're you're crossing the line there. Okay. And you know, how often are you taking photos with your employees in the office? True. Right. I think True. it's always. It, if it's happening every day, I think you've got a problem. And I guess as a final discussion on this somewhat uncomfortable talk we're having um, would be what are the things that we're looking for in terms of evidence before we would file a lawsuit for um, sexual violence or sexual misconduct. And typically what we would want to, to do is have a candid heart-to-heart -heart talk with, with the person we're going to represent, with the victim, 
find out who amongst their circle might know and have details, get uh, written communications from them, so text messages, emails, potentially get receipts from where things have happened. Uh, if the police are involved, that can be a really good source if there's witness statements already. Obviously, if there's any physical evidence, which meaning like DNA, which typically I find that that does not exist. And I can tell you, you know, 60, I think 60 plus percent of all rapes are not reported. So it's vastly underreported. It's going to be really hard to have physical evidence. You know, if you do have a video or, or something like that, that can prove what happens, of course, that's a slam dunk. But usually what we have to do is um, candidly talk to our client who we're going to want to do the best job for, talk to their friends, find their their sort of sphere and put the pieces together with um, with evidence such as communications. And you've seen this in a bunch of our cases. We'll actually get phones and have them digitally, have a digital download of the entire phone done and find messages from 10 years ago or find voicemails from 10 years ago. And, and we can bring those cases with a fairly strong footing because we've done that due diligence to make it possible. Yeah, so photos, videos, social media, text messages, emails, anything at all that can help us prove the case in addition to testimony is the way we would we would go on cases like this. Witness statements. Yeah. But oftentimes these are challenging cases because they are so psychologically um, painful for the victim to report. So we're used to doing these cases when a lot of the slam dunk type evidence might not be there and it might be several years after the fact. That's actually quite common. All right, that wraps up for today. Thanks for stopping by. We'll continue to post uh, weekly videos discussing tips, tricks, personal injury law related matters and other legal matters. Stop by and hang out with us. Thanks again. Leave us your questions.